Good morning, my friends. It is so good to see you all today. As we turn towards our scripture lesson for this day, would you please join me in prayer? Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Still any voice within us but your own. Give us ears to hear you and eyes to see you that we might truly be your servants in this world and see all of those who you lay in our path. And now may the words of our mouths and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our gospel lesson for this morning. So although we are going to be wrapping up our series on the Ten Commandments today, we are actually going to have a lesson from the gospel that will lead us into our sermon today. So listen now to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the man asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved to pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The man said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is summary day, my friends. We have made it all the way through the Ten Commandments. And today is the day that we take a look back to see what we have done and take one more gander at what Jesus, an observant member of the House of Israel, has to say about the whole thing. We must always remember that the Ten Commandments have been taught to children and adults since Moses dropped that third tablet. Thank you, Mel Brooks. When Miss Dixie taught her Sunday school class about them, her students were quite shockingly astute. For example, after learning that they were to honor their father and mother, the young teacher asked them, is there a commandment that teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters? Without missing a beat, little Cindy responded, thou shalt not kill. Out of the mouths of babes, right? So before we look at what Jesus said about the body of the mandates, let's take a look back at what we have learned together this summer. Number one, the very beginning, the commandment upon which all the others sit is that our God is one, the one who saves. Our God seeks us always because our God loves us no matter what. 
It is therefore our job to work with everything we have to stop placing other little g-gods or things or ambitions or ourselves where God should be in our lives. Instead, we are to let God's love rule. Number two, we are to never put God in a box. Whether that box looks like an idol of wood or stone or clay, or instead, like our minds trying to keep God contained into the shape of whatever we wish God would look like. We are instead to open our eyes and our minds and our heart to see who God truly is, something far more vast and wonderful than we can even begin to imagine. Number three, do not use God's name as if it has no significance. Rather than being a prohibition on all cursing, this commandment has far more to do with ensuring that we honor the very meaning of God's name, which is life itself. That means that our word is not merely the oaths that we give, but more importantly, it is the testimony that we give with our lives about the God who loves us and calls us to remember that all life is sacred, and we show that by following the way of Christ. Number four, since the very beginning, God has desired for us to have an opportunity every single week to rest and reconnect, to love and be loved, to know and be known, to be a part of the creative process, to ensure our body's well-being, to let our spirit feel peace. And for those of us who follow Christ, to follow in our ancient siblings' footsteps and recommit ourselves to the work of Christ that will see God's love and justice done on earth as it is in heaven. Number five. While children are meant to give honor to those who love them, we who raise children are meant to create family environments that are built upon mutual love and respect. Parents and other caregivers are meant to ensure enough resources and proper boundaries for children. Children are meant to learn limits and how to show courtesy to people of all ages. And children are meant to learn how to be loving, healthy, hopefully fun, and servant-minded adults by watching their parents. Number six, we all know that we're not supposed to kill people, I hope. Yes? Okay. What we need to remember from this commandment that is that it is our job to make God's life a priority. So anytime we give in to anger or fear or hatred that turns us against our neighbor, it is as though we have killed them. Remember, Jesus said that. Number seven, God created us to be loyal and loving to one another in our relationships that are meant to be healthy and life-giving and loving. We are therefore to take our vows seriously and never enter into them lightly. Number eight, remember that there are countless ways we can loot other people's lives, not just as individuals, but also as bodies of people. It is not just about objects or property. It is also about their health and their livelihood, their reputation, their future, their ability to flourish, and sometimes about their very life itself. And sometimes we do this in ways that uh, mean a simple I'm sorry will not be enough to make up for it. We need to be mindful about our actions and also of the Lazaruses at our gate. Number nine, do not put up with lies. Do not tell them. Do not accept them. Let yourself be uncomfortable so we can finally deal with whatever problems we are actually facing. Protect your integrity and let love rule. And number 10, not everything in life has to be a competition. We cannot control our initial reactions, it's true, but we can control our intentions, our meditations, our plans, and our choices. 
We can consciously decide on a better path forward that puts people first, including our families and neighbors, all of our neighbors. So there you have it, the Ten Commandments. Most of them don't mean what we originally thought or what we were taught. Why? Well, probably because we took them largely at face value or didn't actually listen to what Jesus said. And what are Christians supposed to do? Listen to what Jesus says. Speaking of which, let's look at our gospel lesson. So in three of the four gospels, Jesus has to answer this question about which of the commandments is the greatest. It is always in a context where he is being tested by a lawyer (laughs) or a scribe. They are wanting to know if he knows his stuff, if he is really part of the tradition, and if they really are the best at what they do. Jesus was not the first to summarize the law in this way. Other famous rabbis had already made this same connection. So he is actually quite firmly within the tradition when he gives this answer. It is not a shocking revelation on its own. It's a good summary of the law firmly within the tradition. You love God with the first four commandments, and you love your neighbors with the last six. Then we come to this passage in the Gospel of Luke. The lawyer decides to press his luck, and Jesus does something truly controversial. He tells a story. A man is attacked by bandits and left for dead. A clergy person walks by and sees the man hurting and scurries along, not wanting to be troubled. A person of the historic ruling class, let's just say for our day and time, a politician walks by, doesn't have his camera crew, sees the hurting man, scurries along to hurry to his next event. Now here's the clincher. I want you to picture someone you have historically hated. Someone or a group of people you have assumed the worst of. A group you thought would attack you on sight, rob you maybe, beat you, People you had thought were the worst of the worst. Do you have a group in your mind's eye? Because all of us have a group that we think like that about. Those are the Samaritans. We do not understand this now because of the millennia standing between us, but the hatred between the Samaritans and the Jewish people was very deep-seated. For Jesus to say that a Samaritan helped out this poor wretch was the same thing as us hearing that Malcolm X helped out the Grand Dragon of the KKK. It was controversial. It was unheard of. It was shocking and beyond belief. A contemporary of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rabbi Joachim Prince, once said that neighbor is not a geographic term. He was making the same point that Jesus does in this parable. Your neighbor is every other human being on this planet. It is one of the first lessons that I actually teach our younglings because it is that important. And whether our relationship with our neighbors lasts 10 minutes, 10 years, or 50 years, we are meant to show them the same love and compassion that God has called us to have for ourselves for our families, and for our friends. Because here is the reason that Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets on these two commandments. We really get confused when we don't keep it simple. We tend to want to hold each other to these ridiculous standards while ignoring how badly we are failing ourselves. So Jesus and the other rabbi said, nope, just stick with this. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And in John, Jesus went even further to say, you know what, just love your neighbor, period. Because you can't love your neighbor if you're not loving God. So what do we take away from all that we have learned? Well, things are rarely what they appear to be on the surface. 
it's a good start. Second, if you are wanting these mandates to use them against someone else, you really have missed the whole point and I'm gonna be really, really sad. Third, they were written by God and messed up by humans almost immediately because we're fallen creatures, so cheers. But no, seriously. What do I really want you to remember? Love. Love is the whole point. Run everything through that test. Is what I'm thinking or saying or doing going to serve God's love and life, God's justice and peace? If not, well, maybe you want to rethink your plans. Because my friends, God's love is messy and beautiful. But it is worth it. As Christ himself understood. As God's own self understood. Both from real experience, as scripture tells us. And the Holy Spirit is just waiting. Waiting there to lead us and push us into the fray. So are you ready? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.